Welcome to the August 19th. It's actually a workshop for um, about a housing TIF for a project on the South Gate location. And we'll go ahead and actually maybe just dive right, right into it. So if you would, introduce yourself and a little bit about it. Sure, go ahead. Sure, uh, my name is Kyle Ambler. I'm a real estate development officer for Avesta Housing. And I'm Jim Demesis, and I'm a consultant um, helping out with Avesta from Lemoyne Associates and a Scarborough resident. Thanks for joining us. Even better. <laughs> Just, being <laughs> Just being honest. Just one thing before we get started, we do have half an hour allotted for this. Um, we could either have you stop and ask questions as they go forward with their presentation or allow them to, to move through it, then we can certainly step back. What would your preference be? Anybody? I hate waiting. I hate waiting to ask because then I, sometimes right. it's gone. Does that make right. whatever you guys Just think? Do you know what I mean? Like, do we wait sometimes to the end? Sometimes yeah. things are gone. You forget by the time yeah. you get to the end. Yeah. And if we have a question that could best be answered at the end or on our future slide, we'll let you. Sure. Know. Perfect. All right. Good. Why don't you jump in? We'll jump right in. So I'm going to do a, a quick overview of, of the proposed development. Um, this is the, the site as it as it currently exists. Uh, as you well know, it's the, the old Southgate House, uh, located at 577 U.S. Route 1. Uh, it's currently seven units in the old house, and five of the units are currently occupied. And as part of the redevelopment plan, we will be completely rehabilitating the front unit and adding another 42 units off of the rear. Wow. And this is the proposed New construction on the left, there's the, the front, the view from, from the road, and then the view from the, basically a cutaway view of the side of the property, showing the, the drop down back toward Phillips Road. And as you can Oops, see, and as you can see, the, the, the design intent is, is to, to mimic an, an old farmhouse. So you see the, the restored house up on the front, um, we still, haven't worked out what we're doing with the porches yet, but still sort of in a National Park Services court, but we're working on it. This is the, the location of the project site, right off of Dunstan Corner. Um, this is the proposed site plan for the, the redevelopment. Um, Just for reference, Route yeah. One is to the mm -hmm. right of that frame, and the white is the kind of the existing structures. Right. So the, the existing front house, uh, one of the barns that will be preserved, and then the barn in front will be converted to community space. Mm -hmm. And then the yellow print is the the new forty two unit construction building. So again, uh, 50 units of affordable housing. The, uh, the target area median income for this development will be between 40 and 60 percent of AMI, which right now the, the income level is between 17 and 45 thousand dollars. It's currently located in the town and village center's fringe district zone, <coughs> TVC3. And we're currently in the contract zone application process for the town, as, you, as you're all aware. We're having another meeting later tonight. And we are seeking tax increment financing through the town and approval through main housing to assist in, in the viability of the project. So this is our current timeline. Um, we have the we're still working through the TIF and, and the municipal approval process. Um, the intent is to submit to main housing for the low income housing tax credit round in the first week of October. And if all goes well, uh, construction would start approximately next August with a completion date a year behind that. So well, I'm going to just go over some of the the gut of the TIF essentially, and some of this is just the like applies to TIFs in general in terms of how they work. 
and I'll just walk through that, and then that'll lead into some specific numbers around this particular project. So the core of a TIF is understanding what's called the tax shifts, that basically when you have property valuation increases, it impacts the amount that municipalities receive in state aid for education, municipal revenue sharing, and the amount that you pay in the county tax. So that these are, they're based on the premise, whether you buy into it or not, but they're based on the premise that the, the more valuation you have, the wealthier your town is, the less you should get in state aid, and the more you should pay in county taxes. That's their basic premise. So, um, and again, this applies outside of a TIF. It's just simply how the valuation works within those kinds of formulas. The biggest being the state aid for education, which is the biggest amount of money. But smaller and increasing, uh, decreasing all the time is the revenue sharing component. And then the county tax is based purely on your share of the valuation of the county. Uh, so that's the premise for understanding why TIFs work. And let me just explain some of that. When you, without a use of the, without uh, the use of the TIF, when you run the numbers for the town, you currently lose around 58% of every dollar increase in revenue from increases in valuation. So if you raise a dot, if you have new, if you have new valuation, you raise a dollar in taxes, you lose 58% of that, approximately, and you <coughs> keep 42% of that. Um, and it's based because of, you actually keep the money, but it's because of those shifts that occur with the added valuation, the impacts, again, on the state school funding formula, the revenue sharing formula, and the county tax assessment. So these are standard formulas that are used for each of the towns. They're based on the towns, on the state formulas for education and so forth. And the number varies by town in terms of the exact amount that each town loses or gains in terms of uh, revenue but by doing a TIF, uh, increases in valuation are sheltered. So in other words, they're, they're kept away from those formulas. So the formulas act like they don't, that, that, that TIF, that, that new valuation doesn't occur. It's occurring at the town level. There's still property taxes going on. But in terms of the state valuation for those, for those formulas, it's not being considered. And so you can shelter that for up to 30 years any amount between, I believe, two and 30 years in terms of the TIF. You avoid, by doing so, you avoid those losses due to the county formula and the state fiscal formulas. However, and this is a, a key piece, is um, you can only use those TIF revenues for approved TIF purposes, which have to be determined at the time that you approve the TIF locally. You have to you both determine that locally and in your application to the state, you have to specify what those uses are. And we'll get a little bit into some of those, uh, what you intend to use the TIF revenues for for this project. But that's a critical thing. The money does not accrue to the general fund. It accrues to what's called the development fund. And the development fund can be shared between the town and the developer. Yep. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Based upon what you just said, I'm assuming that the tax revenues from this property are lost to the town completely. What do you mean by lost? Well, we don't, we can't use them. Right now, we can use them. Yep. Well, you can use 42 cents on the dollar of them if, if we would not tip it. Uh, this proposal, half of those revenues would come back to the town, but they are directed in a very specific way. They're not. Let me ask you a very, very simple question. If we approve this, are we going to lose tax dollars? Are we going to have less tax dollars coming into our pocket to spend no. the way we want? Or more? Well, so I can answer that by a slide, which you can okay. give me a minute yep. we'll get to, but don't yep. lose that thought yep. because I want to show you the actual numbers. Because okay. uh, it's a very good question and it has to do with whether it's general fund money or not. Right. Uh, and so just quickly, the, uh, there's, there's different kinds of TIFs, uh, two basic kinds. One that allows you to do commercial properties, and the town has several of those, uh, which are uh, they're administered by the Department of Economic and Community Development, and they're for any kind of commercial or industrial development, but not housing development. 
after the, after the program was on the books for several years, or for quite a few years actually, the state then, through the Maine State Housing Authority, or Maine Housing, developed an affordable housing TIF. Um, affordable housing TIFs allow the money to be used for project operating costs, um, and they, 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 besides being passed by the town, it is, has to be reviewed and approved by Maine Housing and not the Department of Economic and Community Development. Um, it's used to help, it's, its purpose is to provide more affordable rents to local families. And um, the connection with Maine Housing is that it allows, by having a TIF, it gains the developer points with Maine State Housing so that these projects can be ranked and if you have a certain amount of points, it moves you up in terms of the likelihood that you'll be approved by Maine Housing. Not every project gets approved. And I have a slide later on that that talks about sort of why a TIF for this project is needed, which further explains that. And here it is here. So projects are competitively scored by Maine Housing and a TIF is needed to be competitive. Planning board approval, uh, is worth four points in the main housing application. A TIF is worth three. A community revitalization plan is worth another two points. With a TIF and planning board approval, this project scores 56 points. Last year, as a point of comparison, winners needed 54 points and only three family projects were funded. So, so it's a very competitive process and you're right on that sort of sort of projected, if you will, cutoff line of how this project can be competitive. And I, what Jim didn't say, and Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, without tax credits, this project is not viable. Is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. So aside from the sheltering and all the other advantages that were discussed, perhaps in this context, the most important piece is that the TIF get some three valuable points without which the project doesn't move forward. I can piggyback on, on that one thought too. So um, one of the things that has always intrigued me about this project is it's actually a twofer. So we're talking an affordable housing project and, and these points are, are, are kind of key in order and the TIF is key in order to make the affordable housing section and piece of it come to fruition. The other flip side of this is, is a historic preservation project. And just kind of given the nature of the building and its condition and, and those sorts of things, it's unlikely, and I'll, I'll go on that limb. You might, you might not follow me, but I will go on that limb. It's not likely that the building would stay intact. It's not the highest and best use of Route 1 commercial real estate property. And again, the condition of the building. Um, it is certainly on Historic Preservation's high priority list, and it made our approved list and it made the approved top 10 as being you know, vitally significant to, to Scarborough. It's certainly a character and face building for our community. Um, so it's rather in danger without something mm -hmm. moving forward. I mean, I, I'll say I drive by it two or three times a day, and every time I look at it, it I, I twitch a little bit because I'm, uh, I'm one. I mean, I'm, I'm in all honesty. I worry about the structure. I worry about structure fires in that area. I worry about how it looks um, and how it's going to fit in and all the other things that go along when you see a building that's been there for such a long period of time. And from the outside, it looks like it's kind of starting to crumble a little bit. So it's, it's concerning. So let me go uh, now to the actual numbers. So then this gets to the question before about how the money can be used and what, how it's different with a TIF versus not a TIF. And then if you have further questions, you'd be glad to answer them on that. So um, these are mostly estimates, but they're you know based on data that's provided by the town, the town manager has seen. Um, the parcel, um, next year the parcel is projected to be assessed at 442,100. That's as is if it's just left alone. Uh, 40, 40, 442,100, which based on the uh, tax rate yields around uh, $6,800 annually in tax revenues. That money goes to the general fund. Um, so the, pro um, and then, um, but understand that has, because it's not within a TIF, only 58% of that is kept, essentially. Um, I'm sorry, only 42% of that is kept. So if you go ahead with the TIF, you, um, it's estimated to be assessed at $2.6 million. 
Um, so it's quite a substantial increase in valuation, <coughs> yielding approximately $40,000 in annual revenues. But again, I want to be clear, that's without a TIF. It currently, so 58% 50, of the new revenue is lost if you don't TIF it to state and county due to fiscal impacts. So this new $40,000 would yield Scarborough about $16,800 in new taxes. If it were possible to develop without a TIF, and that's, I underline that because that's critical. In other words, right now you're getting $6,800. Right. You have the building in the current condition with your current concerns, and you're losing some of that money anyway um, through, through those, those formula shifts because it's not, a, it's not within a TIF. If you do a TIF, if, if, the project go, if the project were to go ahead, it would generate $40,000 without a TIF, but then about, uh, that would yield $16,800, again, assuming it were possible to develop without a TIF. But again, it likely won't score competitively at main, at main housing without one. Mm -hmm. Now let me carry this over to the next slide and, and, and talk a little bit more about what it therefore means with a TIF. And then we'll go back to the, que the key questions. With a TIF in place, $17,300 in new revenue each goes into the development operating budget and into the town's project account in the first year of full build-out. So in other words, with the TIF, you're able to increase your likelihood that the project goes forward because uh, it gets approval and, and higher ranking by main housing and makes it possible for the developer. $17,300 each is goes to the town's development fund and the developer's development fund. And thus, the town will be ahead of where it otherwise would be even without a TIF. Because going back, remember, you're either getting $16,800 if it were possible to develop without a TIF, but again, it probably wouldn't go ahead and you're only getting $6,800 maximum right now. So with a TIF, you're better off. With the caveat, though, being that the revenues cannot be used for the general fund. They must be used for the purposes specified at the, town of the, at the, at the time of the TIF agreement is developed and approved, and that has to be submitted um, uh, to Maine State Housing, to Maine Housing. And in this case, the town is electing, if you pass it, to have its share of TIF funds going to the local affordable housing initiative fund. So that's the trade-off, and that gets to that key question. Yes? Your, your hypothetical of uh, doing this without a TIF generating $16,800 is it's not really a, a viable, because it's not going to happen in all likelihood. Yeah. So the real comparison would be to the $6,800, because that's probably what it will just continue to be. Does, but my question is, this 42-58% thing associated with how tax dollars that get generated then gets divided up, right. would the 42% be applied to the $6,800? Um, Yes, it would in a sense. I got to be a little careful here. In other words, it's usually applied to, like it's more thought of about new rep. So like that's existing as is. That building right. is, is generating that amount in taxes. So if you, you could say that overall with all valuation in the town, that, that kind of trade-off in what you lose in education funding and, and the other formulas, yes, it does apply, but in the case of TIFs, it's always thought about in terms of the new valuation. Okay. So you. it's the same concept, but it's with TIF, it's always incremental valuation, new valuation going forward. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, no, I, go I ahead. No, no, I just like sliced you. <laughs> um, <laughs> cut you. Um, who determines... So you're, so you're telling us that this TIF money that we get has to be put aside into a general fund purposes. Who decides, it, do we get to decide beforehand what those general fund purposes are going to be before? Just to clarify, they're not general they're not funds. So I'm they're, sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, I phrased it wrong. Tom, can answer that question? Yeah, forgive me, there's a decision point here, and I, it's, and I had involvement to set it up as it's presented here tonight. It, very simply, the proposal is for 50% of the new revenue to go to the developer and for 50% to come to us. Mm -hmm. Based on precedent of the Griffin Road TIF mm -hmm. uh, last year, mm -hmm. 
and also the ongoing efforts of the Affordable Housing Alliance, mm -hmm. uh, I'm suggesting, my recommendation is that we dedicate our 50% toward the established Affordable Housing Initiative Fund, yeah. which has right. a definition of what things it can be used for. And that's a qualified so, purpose that's already been approved by Maine Housing. Okay, so I guess that was what I wanted to make sure, was that <coughs> that, that money wasn't going to be delegated by someone in Augusta. No, no, no. It has nothing no. to do with It's our control. No. Yeah. Um, the, the, the decision point, if we wish, we don't have to dedicate our 50%. It could be a 50% TIF that would satisfy the needs of the developer, and we could receive the other as general fund revenue and use it however we wish. Um, I think it's important to help advance the ongoing mm -hmm. initiatives of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. and, and so we do oh, lose, we okay. do oh, lose oh, $6,800 in tax question. revenue. Question. In general fund revenue. Yes. Right. yes. You're still going to take the money in, but you're going to lose it with yes. those formulas. So this, this, I, this may help if this is the answer that I'm thinking. Yep, go ahead. So just pretend, you know, 50%, we got $2 million uh, valuation, but 50% is TIF. So therefore, <coughs> that million dollar valuation is no longer counted against us for school funding and county and whatever. So therefore, it's an increase in your increase in money so that you can receive from the state. You understand how that works? And that's because the, the value of that property does right. not go into the total calculation. Right. right. For the term of the so there's some, there's a bit of win-win there, too. The so one you mean the term, wait, oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> for the term of the TIF? For the term of the TIF, right, when it expires, and this is proposed to be 17 years of duration, then the full value falls to the tax right. rules and right. we're affected as we are. And I apologize, I actually should have put that in this presentation. Mm -hmm. It's proposed okay. so to be a 17-year TIF. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So after 17 years, it goes just Then like it becomes regular, regular valuation, taxes. right. Um, so, so that's, and that's, that's really important. Yeah. So the taxes are thirty-four six in first year. Seventeen three times two. Yeah. If it's a fifty-fifty, yeah. 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 Right. So yeah. even though it's seventeen years out, what you're proposing to do is is to create a property that's going to really bring up the, the value of the taxes wow. that we have on that property now. Yeah, and it's I mean, I know it's seventeen years down the road, but and it's going to help fund. Uh, you know, a, a priority, or right. a, at least this council, which is affordable housing, right. and having a nest egg right. of, of monies. Yeah. Uh, well, it's infuriating outside, that outside of the budget process. That we have people that can't afford to live in this. Why town. isn't it yeah. forty thousand? Yeah. Why is it thirty-four? Oh, yeah. yeah. oh, really? Yeah. No, it's really. It yeah, it has to do, and I, I mean, the tables are actually in the application. That I think you received in your packet. It's because. Um, it's the increment. In other words, I right. had to back out what you're already, the, the 442000 is already on the books in your valuation. So oh, that's the difference. Yeah. There's it's saying it's it's $2.6 million of new, new valuation. Money. New money. Yeah. yeah. So it's, and, and that's hence the word tax increment financing. It's only on the incremental value. You can't oh. shelter the existing value. Yeah. The 442000 The 442 stays on the books as is. You okay. can't do anything with that. Like so that the, <laughs> The tax money on the 442 goes to the general fund. Yeah. So yes. So yes. Yeah. And I, that's. I'm glad you brought that question. Yes, I, I, tr I try to oversimplify these things, but that 442,100 in valuation, that stays on the books as non-captured, not within a tiff. Huh. Right. So you're still going to get the general fund revenues that's on that. That, that, that yeah. actually yeah. Gets, <laughs> that yeah. gets better to your question. Right. Absolutely. What I try to tell, just to back up for a second, big picture, what I try to uh, tell towns on these is if you're going to do things that have an overriding public purpose that you agree to is important to the town and the development would not otherwise occur, then it makes sense to tip as much as you can. Right. Uh, if those conditions are met, because it's just good financial policy to do so. Right. Um, now, that's a, those are big ifs. They apply in this case, I believe. But right. that's you know that's up for each case, each town to decide. There are other qualified uses of those funds that we could consider going forward. We have to amend our development program, which can be done. Um, but in the early going, um, I know the Housing Alliance is very anxious to start to get some financial resources so mm -hmm. we can either find additional future partners or mm -hmm. other projects, um, not unlike the Habitat project, uh, maybe to buy land and that would be the subsidy to make an affordable project go forward. 
And that's what that fund could be used for? Is yes. Uh, okay. the, right. the council created it. There's five or six different uses that you've allowed it for. Um, things such as purchase of land and okay. I'll provide that to you so you have it. The other point I'll just make is the main state housing requires it to be at least a 15-year TIF duration for it to, to receive the three points. Uh, the reason that they're proposing 17 is that they want 15 of full value. If you remember the, the project timeline that uh, Kyle laid out earlier, it's not until August of 2017, August yeah. 2017 right. that the project's at full Before value, and actually yeah. that one picked up to the following April. So huh. there's a couple of years of slow going, um, and we want to assure them 15 years of full value, so it's a 17-year term. Can I ask just one other question? <laughs> sure. Has anybody done any kind of an analysis of this project and the impact it might have on the school system? Councilor Hayes uh, poked around at some of those questions today. Uh, what I do know, and uh, Kyle, you probably know this off the top of your head, but of the 42 new units proposed, how many are single? So one there's one. 37. Go ahead. Right. So 37 of the of the new units of the 50 total. 37 will be one bedroom. Eight will be efficiencies. Five will be two bedroom units. So the point is, we can't say, can't say with certainty yet, yeah. but the likelihood uh, for efficiencies in one bedrooms to have children is slim. In fact, you have a requirement that limit yeah. the number of occupants depending right. on the number well, of bedrooms. There's going to be history from other projects. There is. So I, I did actually look at 15 properties in our portfolio and I couldn't do a, I couldn't get the data and the time frame to determine the ages. So I went and looked at the number of members of the household per bedroom type. So actually the other sheet. So 91% of our one bedroom units have one person living there and 39% of our two bedroom units have one person. 41% of our two bedroom units have two people in them and all of our efficiency units have one person living there. It's a requirement with us to have I'll, I'll be really so, frank, so. I, that, and I just said this, I, I mean, it's disappointing to me. Um, disappointing to me that, that we still don't have more available housing for small families. I would agree. Um, unfortunately, this is a society, and um, we're not, Scarborough is not above it, that has families that are broken apart. And, you know, we're talking about some single moms and some single dads that need to find places for their families to live and it's right. frustrating to me that we're still Scarborough's still not there yet and I was hopeful that maybe this project would offer a little bit more but I understand the reasoning behind it and I and I get it I just hope that as we move forward as a council we can start maybe looking into some of that stuff a little bit have you yeah and I agree that uh, with all due respect to council blaze you know doesn't matter to me personally how many kids who might be living there who's, who are going to be going to school children need to live somewhere and children need to live in safe clean and uh, affordable housing and as Councilor St. Clair has said this town is a absolute dearth of housing for people so-called working class housing that we need desperately and that includes rentals and I think that this is a great project and I fully intend to support it. Tom, Tom can you tell us about uh, the costs that developers have to pay for uh, school funding uh, fees? Impact fees. For impact fees? Yeah, I can't quote off the top of my head, but there certainly are impact fees uh, for school. Uh, it, it depends on the type of unit, the number of bedrooms, I believe. Yeah. And uh, be, beyond that, the suggestion is, or, or when Councilor Hayes asked this question today, he said, it costs 12,500 educated kids in our district. I think that's a you know, number of kids against the total cost of schools. That's, I think that's a very simple way of looking at it. Uh, we've got a lot of intrinsic costs already built in the school. When we add one or two or five, uh, that's not, brand new, that's not brand new money every time. Yeah. Some of that's state funded, too. True, but, but, you're, but you're we're right. not adding 
That's no, not exactly. actual 12-5 every time a kid comes through the doors right. of the right. school system. Yeah, right. yeah, just a couple of key things on that. With your point well taken about the need for families and that yeah. as a policy, this particular project, based on those numbers of comparables that Kyle did, put very few kids in the school system. Uh, in fact, if anything, it was very, very conservative, those numbers. It was assuming, I think we even looked at, what if you assume that two people in a house meant one kid? That's conservative, because usually it probably wouldn't. Uh, but even then, I think the maximum number was like six kids in the school system, and that was under really conservative s scenarios. Just as a little bit of institutional memory that predates most of you, the town actually did do a lot of studies with this about 15 years ago when the Ballantyne mm -hmm. development was being yep. proposed and those kind of like Teal Point and so forth. And I, full, full disclosure, I worked with this town and the school on how many kids get generated in those kind of units, and there are very few. Right. That's now that doesn't get to your that doesn't get to your point about. Therefore, you need family housing, right. but it does get to the point about these kinds of developments don't put a lot of kids in the Although rent, rentals, yeah, I would think, would be a little different than condos. So it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't really answer <laughs> yeah. the issue. So let me, let me interject. That's seven the end o'clock. of the presentation anyway, um, so go ahead. Do we have any other TIF questions? Because it was just to try to get a sense of housing TIFs and what the Housing tips oh. and, and business tips are a little different functionality wise and they have to be used in certain this, ways. And, this is on the agenda, uh, and these gentlemen will be here. So sure. Yeah, I was going to say we've got. On the numbers. Um, regarding uh, <coughs> how rents are set, um, is, that, is that conditional based upon the TIF itself as well? So, Main State Housing determines the rents for the, the project based on the area mean yeah. um, calculation that they do. Is that for the life of the TIF? It's for the life of the project. Yeah. The project itself. Okay. Then that answers the question. They're not market rate rentals. Well, I mean, uh, it's, what was so this speak. past year, this year? You know, <coughs> the city of Portland was ranked pretty low because of its increasing in rental in, uh, rental properties as far as the increase in rent. And oh. so there's going to be this, you know, kind of concern that once you get the project approved, that maybe the rents start going up. Those rent. And it seems that, like, but it's going to be controlled by the city housing. So the control is a function of. Getting tax credits. Right. right. Really not the tip. Not the tip. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Are the, thank are you. the income levels for an individual or for the couple? Uh, it, it, it depends on household. the housing size, on, um, on the household size. Right? right. So it's determined one way if it's a one person household or single. So single for one person, person household, what's the uh, income range or income back the max? So right now, we'll send we'll send you the actual tables. Uh, with, we'll do a scenario of forty or sixty percent, because uh, these are published as statistics that uh, are known. Okay. I'll, we can certainly do it. Okay. We'll, we'll do a five-minute recess while Great. we while yeah. we're around. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. I know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, there, come on over. And whether it's the income, whether it's the. Uh, uh,